the old people had ordered that the dancing should stop at 10 o'clock but it was almost midnight before the courages came filing up the departing guests it was a moist tropic eve it was a mystic may eve while the girls were staying were promptly herded upstairs to the bedrooms the young men gathering around to wish them a good night and lamenting their ascent with mock signs and moaning proclaiming themselves disconsolate but straight away going off to finish the punch and brandy though they were quite drunk already and simply bursting with wild spirits merriment arrogance and audacity for they we were young bucks newly arrived from europe Gorgio, surno, oh, alas dose, handa do. And it was May again. It was the first day of May, and witches were abroad in the night. For it was a night of divination, a night of lovers. And those who cared might peer into a mirror, and would there behold the face of whoever it was they were fated to. Anastasia, as she hobbled about picking up the pied crinolines and folding up shawls and raking slippers in corner, while the girls climbing in the four great poster beds that overwhelmed the room began shrieking with terror, scrabbling over each other and imploring the old woman not to frighten them. Enough! Enough, Anastasia! We want to sleep! Go scare boys instead, you old witch! She is not a witch! She is Maga! She is a Maga! She was born of Christmas Eve! Saint Anastasia, Virgin and Martyr. Huh? Impossible! She has conquered seven husbands. Are you a Virgin Anastasia? No, but I'm seven times a martyr because of you girls. Let her prosperity, let her prosperity. Whom will I marry, old Gipsy? Come, tell me. You may learn in a mirror if you are not afraid. I am not afraid. I will go. Girls, girls, we are making too much noise. My mother will hear and will come and pinch us all. Aqueda, lie down. And you, Anastasia, I command you to shut your mouth and go away. Your mother told me to stay here all night, my grand lady. And I will not lie down, cried the rebellious Aqueda, leaping to the floor. Stay, old woman. Tell me what I have to do. The old woman dropped the clothes she had gathered and approached and fixed her eyes on the girl. First, you must take a candle and go into a room that is dark and that has a mirror in it and you must be alone in the room. Go up to the mirror and close your eyes and shy. Mirror, mirror, show to me him whose woman I will be. If all goes right, just above your left shoulder will appear the face of the man you will marry. And if all does not go right, then the Lord have mercy on you. Why? Because you may see the devil. The girls scream and clutch one another, shivering. But what nonsense! This is the year 1847. There are no devil anymore. But where could I go? Ah, yes, I know. Down to the sala. It has that big mirror and no one is there now. No, Agueda, no! It is a mortal sin. You will see the devil. I do not care. I am not afraid. I will go. If you do not come to bed, Agueda, I will call my mother. And if you do, I will tell her who came to visit you at the convent last March. Come, old woman. Give me that candle. I go. But Agueda had already slipped outside, was already tiptoeing across the hall, her feet bare and her dark hair falling down her shoulders and streaming in the wind as she fled down the stairs, the lighted candle spluttering in one hand, while with the other she pulled up her white gown from her ankles. She paused breathless in the doorway to the sala, and her heart failed her. She tried to imagine the room filled again with lights, laughter, reeling couples, and the jolly jerky, music of the fiddlers. But, oh, it was a dark den. A weed covered for the windows had been closed, and the furniture stuck up against the walls. She crossed herself and stepped inside. The mirror hung on the wall before her, a big antique mirror with a gold frame carved into leaves and flowers and mysterious corlicus. She saw herself approaching fearfully in it, a small wild ghost that the darkness bodied forth, but not willingly, not completely, for her eyes and hair were so dark that the face approaching in the mirror 
seen only a mask that floated forward, a bright mask with two holes gaping in it, drawn forward by the white cloud of her gown. But when she stood before the mirror, she lifted the candle level with her chin, and the dead mask bloomed into her living face. She closed her eyes and whispered the incantation. When she had finished, such a terror took hold of her that she felt unable to move, unable to open her eyes, and thought she would stand there forever, enchanted. But she heard a step behind her, and a smothered giggle, and instantly opened her eyes. And what did you see, Mama? Oh, what was it? But Donna Gueda had forgotten the little girl on her lap. She was staring past the curly head, nesting at her breast, and seeing herself in the big mirror hung in the room. It was the same room and the same mirror out the face she now saw in it was an old face. A hard, bitter, vengeful face, framed in a graying hair, and so sadly altered, so sadly different from that other face like a white mask, that first young face like a pure mask that she had brought before. This mirror one wild May Day midnight years and years ago. And what did you see? Please go on. What was it? Donna Agueda looked down at her daughter, but her face did not soften, though her eyes filled with tears. I saw the devil. The devil, Mama? Yes, my love. I opened my eyes, and there in the mirror, smiling at me over my left shoulder, was the face of the devil. Oh, my poor little Mama. And were you very frightened? You can imagine. And that is why good little girls do not look into mirrors except when their mothers tell them. You must stop this naughty habit, darling, of you admiring yourself in every mirror you pass, or you may see something frightful someday. But the devil, Mama, what did he look like? Well, let me see. He has curly hair and a scar on his cheek. Like the scar of Papa? Well, yes, but this of the devil was a scar of sin, while that of your Papa is a scar of honor. Go on about the devil. Well, he had a mustache. Like those of Papa? Oh no, those of your Papa are dirty and gray and smell horribly of tobacco, while these of the devil were very black and elegant. Very elegant. And did he speak to you, Mama? Yes, yes, he spoke to me. Charms like yours have no need for a candle, fair one. Badoy smiling at her in the mirror and stepping back to give her a low mocking bow. She had whirled around and glared at him and he had burst into laughter. But I remember you, your my Agueda, whom I left a mere infant and came home to find a tremendous beauty. And I danced a waltz with you, but you wouldn't not give me the polka. Let me pass! But I want to dance the polka with you, fair one. So they stood before the mirror, their panting breath the only sound in the dark room, the candle shining between them and flinging the shadows to the wall, and young Badoy Montilla, who had crept home very drunk to pass out quietly in bed, suddenly found himself cold sober and very much awake and ready for anything. His eyes sparkled and the scar on his face gleamed scarlet. Let me pass! She cried again in a voice of fury, but he grasped her by the wrist. No, not until we have danced. Go to the devil! What a temper has my Serana? I am not your Serana! Who's then? Someone I know? Someone I have offended grievously? Because you treat me, you'll treat all my friends like your mortal enemies. And why not? She demanded, jerking her wrist away and flashing her teeth in his face. Oh, how it does you, you pompous young man. You go to Europe and you come back elegant lords, and we poor girls are too tame to please you. We have no grace like Parisians. We have no fire like the civilians. And we have no salt. I. You have weary me. How you bore me, you fastidious man. Come, come, how do you know about us? I was not admiring myself, sir. You were admiring the moon, perhaps. She gasped and burst into tears. The candle dropped from her hand and she covered her face and sobbed piteously. The candle had gone out and they stood in darkness and young Badoy was conscience-stricken. Oh, 
Do not cry, little one. Oh, please forgive me. Please do not cry. I was drunk, little one. I was drunk and I know that what I said. He groped and found her hand and touched it to his lips. She shuddered in her white gown. Let me go! No! Say you forgive me first. Say you forgive me, Agueda. But instead, she pulled his hand to her mouth and beat it. Beat so sharply in the knuckles that he cried with pain and lashed cut with his other hand. Lashed out and hit the air. For she was gone, she had fled. And he heard the rustling of her skirts up the stairs as he furiously sucked his bleeding fingers. Cruel thoughts raced through his head. He will go and tell his mother and make her turn the savage girl out of the house. Or he will go himself to the girl's room and drag her out of the bed and slap, slap, slap her silly face. But at the same time, he was thinking that they were all going to Antipolo in the morning and was already planning how he would maneuver himself into the same boat with her. Oh, he would have his revenge. He will make her repay. That little harlot. She should suffer for this. He remembered her bare shoulders cold in her candlelight and delicately furred. He saw the mobile insolence of her neck and her tat breast steady in the fluid gown. He sang alone in the dark room and suddenly realized that he had fallen madly in love with her. But alas, the heart forgets, the heart is distracted. In May time passes, summer lands, the storms break over the rat type orchards and the heart grows old. Well, the hours, the days, the months, and the years pile up and pile up till the mind becomes too crowded, too confused. Dust gathers in it, cobwebs multiply, the walls darken and fall into ruin and decay. The memory perished, and there came time when Don Badoy Montilla walked home through a mayday midnight without remembering, without even caring to remember. As he picked his way up the steps to the front door, and inside into slumbering darkness of the house, wholly unconscious of the May night, till on his way down the hall, chancing to glass into the sala, he shuddered, he stopped, his blood ran cold, for he had seen a face in the mirror there, a ghostly light, face with eyes closed and the lips moving. Oh, Grandpa, how you frightened me. So it was you, you young bandit. And what is all this? Hey, what are you doing down here at this hour? I think, Grandpa, I was only... I am only... Yes, you are the great senior. And how delighted I am to make your acquaintance. Senior only. But if I break this cane on your head, you maga wish you were someone else. It was just foolishness, Grandpa. They told me I would see my wife. Wife? What wife? Mine. The boys at school said I would see her if I I look in a mirror tonight and said, Mirror, mirror, show to me her whose lover I will be. Don Badoy cackled ruefully. He took the boy by the hair, pulled him along into the room, sat down on a chair, and drew the boy between his knees. Now put your cane down the floor, son and let us talk this over so you want your wife already hey you want to see you here in advance hey but you know that these are weak games and that weak boys who play them are danger of seeing horrors well the boys did warn me i might see a witch instead exactly a witch so horrible you may die of fright and she will bewitch you she will torture you. She will eat your heart and drink your blood. Oh, come now, Grandpa. This is 1890. There are no witches anymore. Oh, ho, my young vulture. And what if I tell you that I myself have seen a witch? You? Where? Right in this room. Land right in that mirror. When, Grandpa? Not so long ago. When I was a bit older than you, oh, it was vain fellow, true, I was feeling very sick that night, and merely wanted to lie down. Summer and die, I could not pass that doorway, of course, without stopping to see in the mirror 
what I look like when dying. But when I poke my head, in what should I see the mirror? But the witch? Exactly. And then she bewitched you, Grandpa. She bewitched me. And she tortured me. And she ate my heart and drank my blood. Oh, my poor little grandpa, why have you never told me? And she very horrible? Horrible? God, no. She was the most beautiful creature I ever seen. Her eyes were someone like yours. But her hair was like black waters and gold, golden shoulders were bare. My God, she was enchanting. But I should have known. I should have known even then. The dark and fatal creature she was. What a horrid mirror this is, Grandpa. What makes you slay that? Well, you saw this witch in it, and Mama once told me that Grandma once told her that Grandma once saw the devil in this mirror was it of the scare that Grandma died. For a moment, he had forgotten that she was dead, that she had first the poor Agueda. Her broken body set free at last from the brutal prongs of the earth, from the drop of midnight, from the snare of summer, from the terrible silver nets of the moon. Nothing was left of the young girl who had flamed so vividly in a mirror one wild mayday midnight long, long ago. He remembered how she had sobbed so piteously, remembering how she had beaten his hand and fled and how he had sung aloud in the dark room and surprised his heart in the instant of falling in love. Gorgeous, sir, no! Oh, alas dose, handa do!